Um, but I'm going to try to hold questions. Uh, I'm going to have some time for questions, hopefully. Um, but yeah, my talk is about Ember and um, how my team has been using it for uh, Drupal projects for the last couple of years. About two years ago, my team came to DrupalCon LA, and we came with a sort of a goal in mind: how do we how do we f solve this like headless thing? We had a client who was really uh, passionate about doing something cutting edge, and we also were kind of hungry to learn something new. Um, and we quickly learned that we were PHP developers in a JavaScript world, and we might have been a little bit in and over our heads. Um, but luckily, we found something that uh, came with a lot of stuff out of the box and made our jobs a little easier, and that was Ember. Um, Ember, like most MVC frameworks, uh, it's a web app. And uh, I'm going to go quickly through like how it, you know, the life cycle of a page request just to get us started. And then I'm going to talk about the specific reasons why we love using it. Um, but just like Drupal, Ember starts at a URL. And with that URL, it sends it to a router that determines where and what sort of um, controller should render that data. Uh, it's got a route to do that. And that route sends its data to a template. And then that template renders with components. Components are that hot thing that you've probably heard about from React and Angular. Ember's got them too. Um, and that's basically all it is. Done. OK, I'll leave. Uh, but not really. At some point, you need to persist your data. Um, so as you click around your single page app, you're going to want that stuff to stay around. You don't want to keep querying your API more than once. Um, so Ember has this idea of a model. And that model drives your data. And it persists using a library called Ember Data. Ember Data ships with two things, an adapter and a serializer. And these things are actually how your uh, Ember application talks to your back end. So for us, um, we had an adapter uh, that talked with Drupal. And we had a serializer for translating that data coming, back, or coming from Drupal into something Ember can actually use. Uh, by default, Ember has its adapter set up to respect JSON API. And you've probably heard a lot about JSON API at this uh, DrupalCon. Uh, it's kind of a, uh, an ongoing discussion. Um, there's actually a contrib module right now. Um, and it's gotten a lot of traction recently, um, so I would check it in, into it. Uh, but by default, Ember Data is going to assume you're using something that's pretty similar to JSON API. Um, and the models uh, that you have defined in your Ember app, the endpoints for retrieving the information in those models are based on the plural form of your model's name. So if you have a model called Node, uh, by default, according to JSON API spec and what Ember Data is going to look for, it's going to look for something called Nodes, and that's where it's going to find your data. Uh, so for term, it'll be terms. Uh, and these defaults that Ember ships with respect performance, and that was really key for us. Um, JSON API at its core is designed to minimize two things. Number one, the number of requests that your single page app has to make to your API. And number two, the amount of data transmitted between the clients and the servers. Uh, and they all, they, you know, the community that's behind JSON API wants to do that without sacrificing readability. Um, and that's what we found is, you know, it's pretty readable. If you look here, you know, you've got your ID and your type, and that's at the core of what JSON API needs. That's what it defines as a resource object. But then you have attributes. These are like static data. Um, so you're thinking like created date, uh, nid, tid, title, body. And then you've also got this relationships area. And uh, this setup was really great for us because it mapped really easily to Drupal stuff. We were stoked on this. And, we, uh, we finally got it working with Drupal. We built a page, and uh, we started lo kind of load testing it at scale, adding a bunch of content to our page. And um, it was working. But then we saw how long it took to render out a huge page with a ton of data. And I'm ashamed to say it was something around six seconds, uh, which isn't very performant at all. It kind of defeated the purpose of what we were trying to do. Um, and uh, I, I'm, this is my most embarrassing slide, I think. Um, but we weren't finished. We knew that there was a way to do it. I mean, at the end of the day, JSON API is m designed to minimize those requests. We wanted to get that number 64 out of 89 down. And we also wanted to hopefully get this thing to finish in a time that was respectable. Um, so we looked into how JSON API does minimize requests. And it does it through this extra option that you can pass with your responses called included. Uh, this included array, you can pass with it a response and include data about your relationships. So in this case, you see I've got an article that's like my main response data. Uh, but there's a relationship defined to an author. And by default, it doesn't pull this in, but we can set up our APIs to include that author data with our response. By doing this, uh, we were able to reduce our number of requests on that same page down by half. 
And we were also able to speed up our requests. And this is before GZIP and stuff, so it's still not a respectable number. It's not where we wanted, and it's not where we ended up. We actually got this down to below two seconds. Uh, but this is really powerful, and it did it just by default. The only thing we had to do was set up our API in Drupal to deliver that included data, which was really easy because it's just entity references at the end of the day. Um, so it respects, you know, Ember respects these, uh, these relationships, you know, in a way that's performant, but it goes beyond just performance. It just turns out to be really good at handling relationships, and it does a good job with, with integrating with Drupal on that. Um, and it meant fewer lines of code in our API layer. Uh, there were a couple places where Ember code actually helped us to be more performant than just trying to figure it out on the API side. Um, now, I'm not saying Drupal is bad at doing relationships. It's actually really good. Uh, in core, we have this idea in Drupal 8 of entity references, uh, and even in D7, entity references may have well has, have been a core module because it's one of the first things that a developer would install. Uh, but the key characteristic uh, that is limiting about entity references is that by default, they're one way. So if you have a node and you're trying to reference it to a term, that relationship is only going to be from the node, the subject, to a term, the object. But sometimes you need to compute that reverse relationship. In core, you can see an example if you go to see how terms are rendered. Uh, they have like a display of all the nodes that are attached or tagged with that term. Uh, we wanted to do something similar on the Ember side, but how are we going to solve this? Because this relationship is one way. So we were like, okay, um, well, whenever we query for our term, maybe we could add a relationship to our API response from Drupal. You know, terms don't come with this, uh, you know, this tagged nodes thing, but we could, sorry, let me see if I can fix this here. But we could add that, um, this idea of tagged nodes. We can do that right before we send the response. And uh, hopefully, oh man, that's a little annoying. I'm sorry. There we go. But at, once it get, gets to Ember, we could then query the API for that relationship data, and we could render that reverse relationship. Hmm. All right, well, doggone it. I'll keep going. Um, well, Ember comes with a cool way to do this that doesn't require us to send extra data in our payload. And we could have done it with that API way where anytime we crave for a term, we send that you know, tagged nodes data. But Ember supports this idea of inverses. So when we have our node model in Ember, we can define a property to our, you know, a term that we get in our response for a node. And we can say it's going to have many tags. It's going to be tagged by a couple terms. On our term model, we can define an inverse for that. So we can define a property that doesn't exist in an API response for a term, but it can still be tracked by Ember. Um, so in this case, we made a property on our term called nodes, and we told it that there was the inverse to be located on the node model, uh, and it would be called categories. Um, so by setting up this inverse relationship, we were able to render uh, the node data on our term display. Uh, this is really powerful. This, is, this means that you don't have to make your API request be super large to, or your responses to be super large to handle that reverse relationship. It can just do that automatically. If you load six nodes, all tagged with the same term, you can get that term, and then using a property defined with that inverse, you can act on that list of six nodes as if they were attached to your term without that being in your payload. Um, that means that you can do things in uh, Ember that Drupal Core might not ship with or might be complicated to do. Um, so in this example, uh, we wanted to see whether or not we could see where a paragraph was attached to a node. Uh, and so here I'm defining an inverse to a page. And on the page, we define what the relationship is uh, to our paragraphs. By setting up that inverse relationship, we can see from the perspective of the paragraph what page it's attached to. Normally in Drupal, you only see what a paragraph is attached to by looking at the page it's attached to. You can't look at it the other way. Um, so it can support these inverse relationships, but it can also help with in, uh, reflexive relationships. So by extending this idea of inverses, uh, you can actually um, work with entities that relate to its own kind, so like menu links or menu items, rather. Um, if you try to render uh, a, you know, a tree of menu links in Drupal, you'll see that it comes uh, in the database. You've got, an I you've got a parent ID. And the way that it sends that data to Twig is somewhere in the code it's going to compute what child elements are underneath that menu item. Um, when we're working directly with our API, we weren't really started doing that Twig stuff. We were just querying our data from the API. So all we really had available to us was that parent relationship. But if you think about rendering you know, parent and children elements, it's nice to be able to do it top down. So by defining a reflexive relationship in Ember, 
Um, we know we're gonna get the parent from our API response, but what we wanna do is we wanna, we wanna find all the children uh, that are attached to a certain menu item. So what we did was we loaded all of our menu items whenever our Ember app booted up, and by using this reflexive relationship, we were able to do this in our template, where we can basically just render our children from the top down, like you would a normal menu. Uh, and the reason we're allowed to do this is because we loaded all of our menu items at once. I mean, Ember's only so smart, it's only gonna know about the data that you're sending to it, or that it's requesting. So if you try to, uh, if you only send it three menu items, but you wanna render a whole menu tree and do this re in reflexive relationship, uh, it's not gonna render all of them. It's gonna render only the ones it knows about. Um, so by, by having the, uh, we had the requirement to load all of our menu items on every page because our menu showed up on every page. So we got away with this, um, but it was really nice to be able to do this. In the case where you can't and you still have that relationship to find, it will, Ember will, is set up to go find that relationship, um, but that means more API requests, which was our intention uh, to not do that. So uh, by using this reflexive relationship and loading all of our menu items at, at the beginning of the uh, application boot, uh, we actually were able to do this, this uh, nifty thing without having to add extra stuff to our API uh, responses. But this is great. Uh, these are nifty things that Ember comes with just out of the box for handling relationships. Uh, but until now, we haven't really talked about the attributes, um, title and link and things like that. Uh, these are static data. Um, Ember can cast those to certain primitives like string, number, out of the box. But what about like the odd stuff, right? Like everybody's got this situation where they're gonna say like, well, it's not gonna work because the data's weird. Like, I can't use Ember. Or I can't, I can't render this the way I want to. How's it gonna handle this weird looking data? Um, maybe I have a custom field. Or maybe uh, I'm using this third party API and it's just like all borked up. Well that's okay. Um, Ember's got a way to do transformations of data on the field level. It's called a transform. And it makes it really easy to manage your weird looking data. Um, so here's an example of like a list of attributes that we have. And I'm gonna add some here that are custom. We've got like a phone number. Our clients uh, might not wanna enter the phone number in a certain way, uh, or maybe they, they're sort of agnostic about what format they wanna use. Maybe it's just a text field. Well, that's okay. We can transform whatever phone number it is, whatever format it is, into a standardized format on our front end by using a custom transform. And we can do the same thing with meta tags too. The reason we did meta tags in a custom transform was because we needed to act on the data uh, whenever it got to the client side before we actually put them on the page. Um, but what this allows you to do is you don't have to rely on your content managers to enter data in a certain format, although that would be like really nice, and sometimes that's just not the case. Um, but you can use transforms to homogenize that data on the front end rather than having to do it on your app level. So in this case, I'm just rendering uh, phone numbers in a certain format, and anytime we need to print out a phone number, it's gonna be in that standardized format. But transforms also allows you to change your data based on information that's only available once you're like on the client side. Uh, and in our case, we had a requirement to, um, to have meta tags be changed by the, the you know, situation that they were in. So we wrote a pretty long transform, but you can get as complex as you want with these. Uh, and all it is is just some JavaScript and you implement two methods, deserialize and serialize to do this. Uh, but that's transforms. They became really useful for us and we, we liked them. There are a bunch of other helpful things. I don't have like a ton of time to talk about everything that Ember can offer you, but I did pick out a few things that I found like really, really useful when building out apps, especially when coming from like the Drupal side. The first is Ember CLI. Um, React and Angular have these too, but uh, the thing we liked about Ember CLI was that it was really easy to just start an application. So uh, by default it comes with like, you just install it as a node package and you can just generate a new Ember app really quickly. It'll also generate scaffold code for you. You can obviously create the files that you need in Ember uh, just by yourself, uh, but being able to just quickly do Ember uh, generate controller something was really easy and it would stick it in the right place for you. Um, and then once it was done, you could then go in and actually start working. Um, but that was nice, it was a nice thing to have. Automated testing was a big one for us. Um, it comes with a, a test command and what it allows you to do is, um, write, it comes with like a test uh, application built in. It uses Q, Q, Q unit, excuse me, but it can also support Mocha and Chai if that's your flavor. Um, and you can have it do test runs for you just in your console. Uh, it also will abstract your, your NPM in it, like package management, so you can install packages using the Ember CLI tool. And um, as you're coding, you can serve up your app locally, and anytime you make a change, it'll live reload your code. And it'll also lint your code for you. 
Uh, so you can see in this example, like I'm in just I'm in uh, you know making a new app, and it, you can see it installed ESLint, which is uh, as of like Ember 2.12, that's what it's going to ship with uh, by default. But you can you can use other linting libraries out there if if, uh, if if you want. Another big one that we found useful was services. These are different from Angular services. Angular services kind of like uh, re equate to like the way models work in Ember. Um, services in Ember are actually really similar to how services work in Drupal, uh, in Drupal 8. They're good for data uh, and methods that aren't really attached to a specific like model. Um, we used it in our case for navigation sections and being able, uh, being able to show the user where they are in our app. Um, so in this example, we're just adding that little uh, purple and green triangle underneath our menu items. It's something pretty confectionary, but it's nice to be able to give the user like that sort of active menu item state. And uh, it needed to work across multiple routes in our app. So being able to uh, have a service that spanned across all of those routes made it uh, really easy to manage that. Uh, other uses for uh, services could be breadcrumbs, um, handling third party API requests, or uh, something like WebSockets. Another big one, if uh, you're worried about SEO or if that's a big limiting factor for you before you start to think about MVC frameworks is Fastboot. Um, Ember's answer to uh, SEO and pre-rendering is Fastboot. It's like isomorphic JavaScript. Basically, it, it's a set of tools that allows you to um, do some business logic based on whether or not your app is running on a server or uh, on your client. Uh, the way SPAs work is, uh, by default, when you first load the app, your page source is blank. It only really has like a skeleton of what your app's going to be. And the JavaScript is what does the uh, work of putting the markup in place. Um, but it happens like as you boot up your app. What Fastboot allows you to do is when you hit a page URL, it will bring, a, it'll kind of pre-render that markup that would have been generated by your JavaScript and put it in the page for you. And then once the page has been delivered to your, the, the front end, uh, the Ember app will then start up and all of that markup was already there. Um, so you kind of have this perceived performance gain uh, and it also helps with uh, SEO because that stuff is just automatically rendered for uh, Google or Facebook or Twitter. Some other helpful things we found, um, and I don't have gifts for them, I'm sorry, um, were a API, API mocking with Ember CLI Mirage. Um, this was like, uh, excuse me, sorry, there we go. Um, API mocking. This allowed us to do small things like we didn't really know what our API was going to look like, but we wanted to get into Ember and kind of play around. Um, when we had some third-party APIs we needed to integrate with, uh, we could mock them while they were being built by our third-party vendor. We were, allowed, we were able to drive our tests without, an API, without a live API, which proved really useful whenever we were trying to you know, do tests as part of our CI. Um, we didn't have to necessarily connect to the internet to do it. We could just kind of give it some data and um, use that test data. And it also allowed for concurrent front-end and back-end development. So uh, we didn't have to, as back-end developers, provide our front-end developers with a Drupal API to point to. We could just give them some mock data and they would be totally fine using that and rendering out their components and building their front end layer without having to have like a complete API behind them. And they actually really liked it because it meant they didn't have to have a local version of Drupal installed, which was kind of nifty. Uh, the second thing is the accessibility community in Ember is uh, really active and helpful. It's one of the best I've seen. Um, and you'd think a lot of, you know, accessibility and JavaScript might not pair well together, but when you're talking about MVC frameworks, you get things like data binding. And that actually can be a really big help when you're trying to make something accessible. I mean, think about like ARIA roles and tab indexes. And wouldn't it be so great if you could just bind that to data coming from your, you know, your application state? And it becomes a lot easier to, and a lot more convenient to work uh, accessibility into your app from the beginning. Uh, and the third thing, uh, Ember as a community uh, does get a little bit of flack for being one of the more, quote, bloated uh, frameworks out there. It comes with a lot. So it's, it's not like, um, it's not any less performant than any of the others, but it does have a larger kilobyte size. If that really matters to you, um, look into Ember engines. These allowed you to basically divide and conquer your app into smaller sections uh, and lazy load them even uh, based on what part of an app you need to load at a certain time. Uh, and basically it's just like several apps that work together. So that's not the full story. Uh, at the end of the day, we still had a lot of things we wanted to do and we're working on them currently, like we're not done. Uh, the first is we want to figure out how to do image styles better. 
Uh, right now we have a model for them in Ember, and we're loading data through an API endpoint. Um, but that might not be the most performant thing. Uh, it means one more API request before we even get a URL for our image. Um, would it be, wouldn't it be nice if we could just deliver that with our node? That means we have to tell Ember about what image styles each node would need throughout the life of its, of its you know, state in the app. Um, so there's some nuances there we just haven't fully figured out yet, but we have some ideas. Uh, redirects, too. Right now, we're using, redir like we're doing redirects on the server level, which is fine, but it's not really robust and it doesn't allow the client to, um, you know, customize their redirects. They have to kind of come to us or they have to use their server. Uh, they have to manage the server um, and add those redirects, you know, routinely. So if it's like a new launch, they're fine because you know those redirects, but if you have a page you want to change, it's a little cumbersome to have to go to the HD access file or your Nginx map and change them. Um, we would like something more robust, but we haven't figured it out yet. Um, and the third is a synchronized path structure. At the end of the day, Ember and Drupal both need that URL, right? That's like the, that's like the only thing that they really have to work on because they're web apps. Uh, Drupal's got this nifty thing called Path Auto, and it allows you to make pretty URLs, uh, and you can customize them as, uh, you know, to your, to your leisure. What we wanted to do was give that flexibility to the front end. Um, we have a solution for it, but it's, it, you know, it, I'm, I'm going to confess it's a little hacky, and it's not something like that's fully, fully fledged out. Um, but it works for us, uh, and I'm going to explain it just in a little bit here. Basically, we had the, um, we didn't have something like JSON API, uh, the contrib module to work with when we built this. Uh, but we have this idea of, and it's the, the last line there, alias path. What we're doing is when we construct our routes for our API, we have this idea of an alias path. And what that is used by is our parameter converter that we just called title converter. And what it does is that uh, alias path allows us to, per route, tell us where, um, where, like what path auto stream we're working with. Now if we pair that with an ID that we send to Ember for all of our nodes, that's the last part of the path auto alias. Um, instead of using like NID or, or a unique ID, we just use the like pretty path, um, just the dasherized version of it. What we're able to do on the controller in Drupal for that parameter converter is turn it into uh, a path that we can just query for in the database. Um, so you can see here we're just selecting from the path auto alias table. This would be really great if path auto was a field on the node, because then we could use something a little bit more ro robust to query. Um, right now we're having to do it through a separate table. Um, it's not the best situation, but it does work. And we can rely on path auto just to generate unique IDs built for us. Um, it is, it, because of Ember, it respects um, the ID. So if you have a term and a node name the same thing, because they have different types, you're going to be all right. Thank you. Um, my pain, my team's pain doesn't have to be yours. Uh, there are some things to look forward to uh, when we're talking about integrating Ember and Drupal. The first is the contrib module JSON API. It's being considered for a core module, uh, and there's a lot of traction uh, behind it. And I, I, I highly recommend you talk to Mateo and Wim. Uh, they're here, and they're, um, they have a lot of great ideas, and, and it's, it's gaining a lot of popularity as being sort of like the de facto um, API uh, thing to use whenever you're making Drupal be your API. Um, beyond that, if you do end up using JSON API as a, as a contrib module to, to you know, use Drupal in that way, um, there is a set of data adapters that you can, you can download. Um, I, I, I really want to meet this person. Uh, I, they just wrote these like, small adapters that allow you really easily to plug into what JSON API is going to give you from Drupal by default. You don't have to do a lot of customization with it. Um, there's a, few, a, little, a little bit of configuration to, uh, before the, it'll start working, but Ember Data Drupal is a great GitHub repo that I recommend you check out if you just want to kind of toy around. And the last is, if you were here for the previous talk, Ed Faulkner talked a lot about the card stack project. Um, this sort of goes beyond what I'm, what I'm discussing. I'm, you know, I'm just discussing about Ember and Drupal, but um, he wants to take this, uh, he, and, he and the card stack team want to take something that's uh, you know, decoupled, this idea of decoupled CMS with its front end and make them seem like they're seamless. Right now, the way that my team's been doing it, they're a little bit separated, by definition decoupled, but they don't necessarily have to feel like two different applications. And that's something that the CardSec team has uh, been working on for a while, so I suggest you check that out too. And that's the end. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to take them.
what problem were you guys solving um, that made you choose Ember.js, and why did you choose Ember.js versus the other apps like um, Angular or React? Sure. Uh, so the question was, like, why did we choose Ember, and what problem were we trying to solve? Um, the, the main problem we were actually trying to solve was a client who wanted something new and innovative, um, which was that's like the greatest thing, right? When you have a client who's willing to do it, um, it's like I'm getting paid to learn. That's, that's like the best situation. Uh, we also did want to learn, uh, so coupled with a, a client that wanted cutting edge, um, we just wanted to try something. The reason we picked Ember um, started because someone had used it on a personal project, so it started as just that like seed of like we've heard it before. Um, but as we researched it, we wanted something that was uh, opinionated at the end of the day. We didn't really have a lot of opinions to begin with. Um, and actually, that's something I did cut out of my talk, was this idea of opinions. Um, everybody's got one about JavaScript front-end MVC frameworks, and they're all like, like you're all entitled to have them, uh, and I'm entitled to have one about Ember. Ember itself is opinionated about you know, the things that it ships, but I hope that as you've seen, it allows you to do things that are very different and uh, and it's, it's not necessarily opinionated as it is. In, like, it just gives you some defaults and then enables you to work the way you want. Uh, and that's what we liked about it. We wanted something that, we, that was opinionated enough for us to ship quick, but not opinionated enough to where we were, where we were fighting it a lot the whole way. Uh, and so that's why we picked it. Okay, thanks. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to say that you did an awesome job up there, especially with the guys working around you. Good job. Um, you said that one of the uh, benefits was that it abstracts the package JSON. From, from, what do you mean by that? Oh, all I mean is that um, it, it comes with a package uh, .json file to manage right. your dependencies. Um, the way that Ember does like contrib modules is through these things it just calls add-ons. Um, at the end of the day, there are NPM packages that you can install. Um, okay. And because you're in a sort of a client-side scenario, you're able to install like other node packages like um, one that, I, that we like to use at my company is the, the fetch protocol. There's a polyfill for it. Yeah. And 